Bees just have a lot of charisma. You've kind of got to admit that a fluffy little insect buzzing from flower to flower is a fairly appealing organism compared to, you know, cockroaches or bedbugs or some of the other important insects that one might study. And their diversity is really impressive. Like you might think bee, but in fact you have this whole range of body sizes and colors, and some of them are, live in social colonies, some of them are solitary, every bee makes her own nest, lays her own eggs. Some of them are very picky eaters, some of them need a whole bunch of different plants to balance their diets. So there's a whole range of behaviors that bees include that are really interesting to, to study. Our state, North Carolina, is home to 560 species of bees. This certainly includes your standard cast of bumblebees and honeybees, but if you took a trip across the state, from mountains to sea to our very own campus, you would find many other more colorful characters. You'd find green sweat bees and blue orchard bees, southern carpenter bees, squash bees, and many, many others. And together, this collective provides an important service to our state, pollination. Pollination is how plants have sex. The male parts of a flower produce pollen, which needs to make it to the female parts of a flower to fertilize it. And only then can most plants produce seeds or fruit. Bees help with this process because they travel from flower to flower, collecting pollen and nectar mainly to feed their offspring. In the process, they move pollen and fertilize the flowers they visit. Globally, nearly nine out of 10 flowering plant species, including three quarters of crop species, benefit from pollination by an animal. And usually this means bees. This is important because plant reproduction is essential for natural ecosystems to sustain themselves. And bee pollination in agriculture accounts for about one-fifth of all the food in your diet, plus the majority of several important vitamins. Without bees, yields would drop and malnutrition would become more common. This all makes pollination an example of an ecosystem service, which is a natural ecological function that is essential for human well-being. But pollination is a service that may be in trouble, Populations of terrestrial insects, including some bees, are declining worldwide. For example, bumblebee species have been disappearing from the warmest parts of their geographic ranges as climate change makes those areas even warmer. Climate change is probably also a threat to other bees that are just less well studied than bumblebees. This might not matter too much if some of our other 560 species of bees could just buzz in and do the job instead, but diversity itself can enhance ecosystem services. For a given plant species, in a given place, it usually takes five or six bee species to really thoroughly pollinate it. This is because different species of bees forage at different times of day, behave differently on flowers, or visit flowers on different parts of a plant. Some may focus high or some focus low, for example. These differences mean that three bees each of three species do a more thorough job than nine bees of one species. This phenomenon is officially known as functional complementarity among bee species. And when you scale this complementarity up across multiple plant species and multiple locations, you end up tapping a lot of bees to get thorough pollination across the board. So even though there are hundreds of bee species, there might not be a lot of extras. So it's important to understand how climate change is going to affect bee diversity and the pollination services that bees provide. And this is what my research team wants to understand. And we do it by working in cities, including Raleigh. Cities create their own little climates that are warmer than the surrounding landscape. And Dr. Deanna Beasley talks more about urban heat islands in her video. Urban warming puts cities several decades ahead of the global warming curve and gives us a chance to see how organisms, including bees, cope with a warmer climate. We're currently growing cucumber plants at different places around Raleigh in hotter and cooler locations. And we'll be looking at how the bee community that visits those plants differs in hotter and cooler places, and then what the consequences of that are for the amount of pollen delivered. And then we have collaborators doing the same thing in Georgia and Michigan, so we can also start to understand how warming affects organisms differently in warmer and cooler climates overall. So far, this urban research has some good news results and some bad news results. The bad news is that in Raleigh, overall bee abundance does decline in the hottest parts of the urban heat island, which supports the idea that climate change is not great for bees. 
But the good news is that not all species decline equally, and a few even seem to benefit. So now we want to know how those remaining heat-tolerant bees do at pollination. In other words, does this new heat-tolerant bee community still include efficient pollinators? And does it still encompass all those little variations between species that produce functional complementarity? I don't have those answers yet, but when we do, I hope that we can use them to specifically manage urban habitats in a way that will support a diverse and high-functioning bee community, even if it's not the original community. Then it will be most exciting if we can use what we've learned in cities to help plan for a more resilient, well-pollinated future throughout the state. As our environment changes, we may not be able to keep every one of our 560 species of bees. In fact, some are probably already gone. But by understanding how they work together and how they respond to a warming climate, we may be able to keep their pollination service intact. So plants can still reproduce and we can still enjoy a varied, nutritious diet of bee-pollinated foods. <laughs>